Okay, right. Good morning. Welcome to Evening 57 uh, Annual General Meeting here. I'm Kenny Huang, Chair of Evening Executive Council. Today's agenda is full with uh, a lot of discussion and decision. So starting from we have, we are going to conduct Evening Easy election today and three positions are up for election. So it's crucial for all members to participate by casting your vote. In uh, addition to that, uh, we also have uh, APNIC activity report for in 2023. And also we have we are outline active, APNIC activity plan for 2024. It's very important for you to give in the comment, uh, especially uh, your input will shape the future direction of the APNIC. I think that's a very critical uh, situation for especially for annual general meeting. It's a value and opportunity for everyone to participate in addition to that, and we also passed two policy proposals uh, in the a policy six a meeting yesterday. We need to conduct and we need to seek consensus uh, on this proposal in today's meeting following the APNIC policy development process. I encourage all of you to active participant, share your thought, uh, collaborate openly. Your input definitely will shape the future direction of APNIC. Once again, thank you for your participation and your input is very valuable in this meeting. And thank you for being here for today. I, in, I look forward to a very productive and engaging meeting today. Thank you very much. Okay, following our agenda, next one will be, let me check. Okay, now will be uh, announced the APNIC EC election procedure. Uh, I move forward to APNIC uh, Legal Council, Jeremy, to, to give in the introduction about APNIC EC election procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenny, and good morning, everybody. Uh, this year's APNIC EC election has three uh, seats available. Three members of the EC are retiring after the expiry of their two-year term. They are all el eligible for re-election. Uh, the two-year term will start from being elected today. The election timeline, this timeline is uh, modified uh, to reflect the uh, one-day suspension of the election at the very start. So nominations open uh, approximately eight weeks before uh, the annual general meeting and closed in no less than two weeks uh, before the AGM. Member online voting and uh, proxy appointment open approximately 10 working days before the election and closes 48 hours before the AGM. Uh, proxy online voting opens at the start of the AGM this morning. That's 9.30 and will close at 2.30 p.m. That's local time here in Bangkok. Uh, APNIC uh, member corporate contacts and those contacts with uh, appointed voting rights can cast the votes in the election and the number of votes for each member are determined by their membership tier. 
Uh, the nominations, uh, which have all been completed, uh, were to be submitted by corporate contacts through an online form. And there was a four week nomination period starting on Monday, the 8th of January and closing on Thursday, the 8th of February. This year, we also have uh, a new process with the Electoral Committee, which was put in place under last year's bylaw reforms. Uh, and uh, they, the Electoral Committee is responsible for overseeing the eligibility of nominees and also their conduct in elections. And so this year, the Electoral Committee members were Donna Austin and Rita Chowdhury, Akinori Maimura, Kiko Akawa, and Aftab Siddiqui. Uh, online voting, as I mentioned, uh, Corporate contacts and contacts with voting rights can cast their votes through the Big Pulse voting system, uh, and they do have until 2.30 p.m. today to cast their votes. Uh, proxies can also be appointed by corporate contacts, uh, and they will uh, vote on behalf of the member. Once a proxy is appointed, the member does lose their voting rights. It moves to the proxy entirely. And as I mentioned earlier, proxy voting does open today at 9.30 a.m., the start of this AGM, and we'll close at 2.30 p.m. That's UTC plus 7 this afternoon. At the close of voting, uh, we'll have election officers who will hold a meeting uh, with the scrutineers, and they will download the election results and send those to the election chair. Those results will be announced this afternoon at 3.30 p.m. local time. And the election chair will also disclose any disputes that were raised during the election and uh, the resolution of those disputes. This is an example of what the election results look like. Uh, they'll be released this afternoon. That's the format from AP Inc. 55. The election chair this year appointed by the EC is Kanchana Kanchanasit from uh, AIT's Interlab. Uh, Kanchana is independent from any AP Inc. member, which is a requirement uh, of the election procedures and has no interest in the election results. And the election chair's responsibilities are to oversee the election process, appoint the scrutineers, declare the results, and also resolve any disputes. The election officers this year appointed by the EC, uh, Andre Gelderblom and Connie Chan, who are appointed from the AP NIC Secretariat. Their responsibility is to administer the call for nominations, manage the voting process, and also to retrieve the voting results. The election scrutineers are appointed by the election chair, and this year we have uh, two uh, scrutineers, uh, Alfredo Verderosa from LACNIC and John Sweeting from Aaron. Uh, so thank you for agreeing to, to participate as scrutineers. Uh, they're selected from the staff of uh, other internet organizations present at the meeting. Uh, they do not vote and must be independent from any APNIC member or candidate. And so they will observe the downloading of the election results and then notify the election chair if there are any anomalies. For disputes, um, if there is any complaint regarding the conduct of the election, so that's relating to being able to actually exercise your votes, uh, it is to be lodged in writing with the election chair no later than one hour before the scheduled declaration of the election results. So that would be 2.30 p.m. local time today. Those notices can be sent to election-chair at apnic.net. The election chair um, does have the power to resolve the disputes at their discretion. And finally, just, just to note, complaints regarding nominee conduct do need to be sent to election-conduct at apnic.net, and that will be provided to the Electoral Committee for their review. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd now like to invite uh, our election chair, Kanchana Kanchanasit, uh, to introduce the nominees. All right, good morning. Uh, I first need to introduce myself. I, my name is Kanchana Kanchanasut from Thailand. I am now a retired professor at the Asian Institute of Technology. I'm happy to be uh, working as this uh, election chair. Uh, I'm very honored to, to be with you all today, and I'm going to introduce the uh, nominees. Uh, uh, you can find all the nominee profiles and statements on the APNIC EC election website. Uh, we will uh, introduce them in order of the, the nomination that we received, the, uh, the APNIC received. I would like to introduce the nominee to you in, in this order. So the first nominee is 
Kang Su Seyung. This is Kang. Everybody knows him. <laughs> uh, next, uh, the second nominee is the Sumon Ahmed Sabir. Okay, the third nominee, uh, Vincent Atiensa Ashi. The fourth nominee, Thomas Dracono. Last but not least, the fifth nominee is Robert Rob Thomas. Right. So I wish all the nominee the best of luck in today's election. Uh, member online voting is already open and proxy online voting is now open to proxy voters who meet the voting criteria that was explained earlier by Jeremy. If anyone is having any voting or login issues, Please contact APNIC Help Desk by phone or live chat. I would like to declare that this uh, voting is open and it will end at 14.30 or UTC plus seven today. I will come back to announce the election results during the AGM at 15.30 or UTC plus seven today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kachana. And next one, I'd like to invite Paul Wilson to deliver APNIC activity report for 2023. Well, Paul, let's move over to you. Thank you, Kenny. Um, thank you, EC. Thank you all for, for being here. The end of a, the end of a long week. Uh, this is the activity report for 2023. Uh, this uh, should be available to you on the um, uh, meeting website. Uh, if you want to follow along, if there's anything not clear on slides, for instance, uh, there will be plenty of time for questions, I think, during the rest of the day, if not immediately after this uh, this report. I think we're all familiar with this, um, this classical diagram, which has been shown a couple of times a year for the last four years. Um, it, is, it represents the four-year strategic plan, which ended last year. And so this is the last time you'll see it. And what you'll see shortly after this presentation is what uh, what we're doing uh, and how we're representing the next four years. But for the last four years, we've been reporting against five pillars, uh, members, membership registry, development, information and capability. Uh, those pillars that uh, support our vision and mission and based on our values and our credo. A nice structure there to, uh, to represent the, uh, the organization. So I'll just go through the five pillars and the highlights uh, from the last year uh, under each of the pillars, starting with membership. So APNIC members have nearly hit, or maybe by now they have hit uh, 10,000, but by the end of last year, it was just under 10,000 uh, direct members that we had and uh, nearly 15,000 NIR sub accounts. So we often say that APNIC is serving approximately 25,000 uh, organizations around the, around the region, directly or indirectly, who um, build the internet for us. The service satisfaction that we register is 96% uh, excellent and above average. The um, SLA for 40 hour, eight hour business time response uh, is 99.97% met. We collect a lot of feedback, uh, nearly 4,000 distinct feedback items through different channels, nearly a thousand of them requiring action and 100% of those resolved last year. We, we're engaging with users across uh, across um, users and members across different platforms as well. And um, there were 391 engagements directly with users on uh, services uh, research and uh, 293 in 40 different economies on technical topics and uh, requirements such as our PKI and transfers and uh, general technical assistance uh, and the big uh, project of the last uh, year or so, which is the historical resource transition. 
We don't have a lot of fraud attempts, but we had 28 uh, that were detected, um, resolved last year. And the charts just show two different views of the total APNIC uh, service um, community, uh, NIRs uh, versus APNIC at the top and the sub-regional distribution at, at the bottom. As you see, nearly 25,000 in total. So I mentioned this big project, Historical Resources Transition. This may be the last time that you see this slide, which represents um, around two years of work, um, starting with a whole stack of cases on the left at the beginning who uh, were identified as the historical resource holders uh, at the beginning, uh, yet to contact all of them. But as time went on, we went through contacting all sorts of efforts to contact, to um, inform, to update, to resolve uh, their um, historical resource status. And that that resulted in historical resources being claimed uh, by the holders and then properly registered and brought into, brought into um, proper maintained registration and membership agreement. Um, it uh, resulted in quite a few resources being returned and reclaimed by APNIC, and they are already being recycled, and I'll talk about that shortly. And then there's a few other status uh, lines there. We've got a, a very small number of uh, cases still to resolve, um, some cases which are routed and where the custodians are um, declining to engage with APNIC on the on the next steps, and we're resolving those in uh, in due course. It's obviously a pretty careful uh, process of making sure people understand what's going on and uh, and are properly, properly informed of, of what's about to happen. Uh, and in, in numbers, here are the, the main cases of registrations being removed. Uh, resources being recycled, being claimed by the holders, and uh, 120 cases, uh, which are routed cases, yet to be uh, resolved. Uh, the number of addresses uh, concerned there, 7.3 million, and um, uh, quite a number, uh, over 2 million that have been uh, reclaimed, recycled, uh, 4.5 million claimed, just 300,000 left in, pro in progress. Uh, membership products. There are there's a public uh, roadmap for each of our product groups, starting with membership products, and uh, we begin the year with a bunch of roadmap goals, which uh, stay on that uh, roadmap uh, through the year, and hopefully most of them are completed by the end of the year. But also, as as time goes on, we need to add additional goals to the uh, to the roadmaps to um to represent things that have that uh, come up that are needed. Uh, sometimes things like um policy approvals, which we can't predict in advance, um, other um, improvements that we um, find are needed and things like taxation issues that might come come at us um, surprisingly. But we've, um, we track all these goals. They're, as I say, they're, they're publicly reported, uh, most of them completed. Um, and uh, and um, in this case, none of them, uh, one of them left to be, um, to be finally uh, implemented or completed, which is um, improving member contact management in my APNIC. So I'll move along to uh, registry. That's the second of the pillars. And uh, this is a, a set of charts for resource delegations for IPv4, V6 and ASNs uh, reported according to the subregion in which those allocations have happened. And as we see, IPv4 uh, sought a steady state for the last several years, like IPv6. Uh, IPv4 has ticked down a little, IPv6 up a little. ASNs have got a very big um, spike just in uh, 2021 when there were some large allocations made to um, large confederation members that happened to uh, happen to request at the same time in China and, Indi and India. And here we see the effect of the historical resource um, reclamation where we have a, a pool uh, measured in slash 24s on this on this particular chart. But we um, count uh, resources either as resources that we hold either as available for allocation or as reserved pending further action. And so we did return back in January, we, we returned um, resources uh, into the available pool. In uh, July, August, we also reclaimed uh, something like, as you see there, about 5,000 slash 24s from the historical resource uh, reclamation. And they, they are sitting in the reserve pool at the moment. There's a, a time required before uh, reclaimed resources go from the reserve pool into the into the available pool. And of course, there's no particular need to do that until the available pool is is um, is, is depleted. So we, we do take care um, in uh, in making sure that reclaimed resources are uh, are um, 
uh, are given a chance in case there's any um, any issues that arise with those before we um, uh, pass them on to uh, to APNIC members. IPv4 transfers, uh, but they're being represented here as uh, intra, that is within APNIC transfers, uh, intra RIR transfers, mergers and acquisitions. And the, the line at the top of the line that trends upwards there is the count of the number of transactions, which is hitting um, around 800, nearly 800 transactions uh, per year, um, slightly higher in 2021, but still around that level for 2023. And it's quite erratic. The, the, there's no particular pattern in the way transfers are, are happening, whether they're inter or intra RIRs or mergers and acquisitions. It's really whatever, whatever happens, hard to predict, um, but that's how we can report it. Now, moving on to products, we've got registry products. And again, as I mentioned before, these things are all documented on the, on the product roadmap. And the, these are um, uh, related, this particular list is related to the registry products and the, the status of those products. Um, so uh, availability of, um, of our main registry services is, is at four nines. We're not able to report that, that third decimal digit uh, yet, but the systems are being improved. So we can at least, even though we're not actually targeting five nines, we can see how close we are to, to five, five nines in future, hopefully this year. Uh, implementation of policy proposals, as I said, uh, something that was demoed and discussed this week was the uh, registry a API, which has been released in, in beta, and we actually had it as the target for a hackathon activity at the beginning of the week. And um, as I mentioned, the five nines issues, we did have a consultation about the importance of five nines to the to the members and stakeholders, and um, and it wasn't definitive. So um, the EC has considered that endorsed our current be benchmark of, uh, of four nines for the critical services. And here are the here are the status of of products, uh, the the original roadmap goals, the additional goals. Uh, there are quite a number of additional goals in progress. It's a pretty busy area. The um, the registry product team uh, looking at um, RPKI resilience, uh, the um, R RDAP architecture, um, participating in the IETF with a number of IETF drafts. And uh, one of those roadmap goals was deferred, as you see here. So that's that's part of the pipeline of of roadmap goals that uh, that that the product groups go through, and uh, that's the deferral of one goal, which was uh, direct ASN assignments for for NIRs. Policy development. It was a pretty busy um, year last year. We had. Um, three implemented and one um, endorsed and yet to be implemented, a couple of policies abandoned, um, but three of them continuing and being sent back to the, having been sent back to the mailing list. So the policy uh, development process, we'll hear a bit more about that um, in terms of what's happened at this meeting, but the policy development process is, is alive and well, and um, and it's, get, it's getting pretty good participation these days. The third pillar, excuse me, the third pillar is, is de development, which includes conferences for a start and uh, our participation at uh, APNIC 55, which was this time last year with Apricot 2023, uh, was pretty good, 740, 504 at the next meeting, APNIC 56. We have uh, 100 or so remote Zoom participants, but a lot of YouTube remote activity there with, um, with hundreds of hours of, of viewing. And we covered 54 economies. Um, first time and uh, 47 in the second meeting last year. And the net promoter score is pretty good. Uh, anything above uh, zero is good. And 80 is 80 and 76 are both uh, really outstanding uh, net promoter scores for the conferences. Under development, we also have support for the technical community in a whole lot of different ways, which are, which are um, summarized here. 41 different technical community events, which we participated in last year, including 25 NOGs. So APNIC staff were there uh, in person and or online. Uh, APNIC was providing sponsorship, uh, speakers, training and technical support to the to the NOGs themselves and to the other um, technical community events. And there were a couple of new NOGs in, in Korea and in uh, uh, Afghanistan that uh, was supported by APNIC as well. Uh, we're counting security events uh, in particular these days. They've got um, they've got a very high importance in the community. Uh, we are, are holding um, four quarterly threat sharing events based on the the HoneyNet uh, project. There were certs in um, Bhutan, Vietnam, Vanuatu, New Zealand, Fiji, and uh, Myanmar. 
uh, that uh, that were supported by APNIC activities, and uh, and we also uh, still participating in in first, uh, and in particular in the um, in mentoring at the annual conference last year. Internet cooperation more generally, uh, participation with other internet organisations, including NRO, the other the other RIRs, um, ICANN, IETF meetings, uh, others like APTLD, Internet Technical uh, Community Coordination, and what we call ISTAR in general, which is the um, uh, IETF, IAB, ICANN, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, internet governance, in, uh, mostly under the banner of IGF and its associated activities, but there was an IGF globally in uh, in 2023 last year, of course, and APNIC staff have been involved um, with uh, prep, uh, with preparatory processes for for the IGF quite uh, quite heavily. Joyce Chen has been our um, our uh, MAG member uh, up until this year. There's also the regional IGF that we um, at APNIC we were help we were uh, helping to co organize. Excuse me that um, that meeting, and uh, there were many many. Uh, excuse me, um, steering group and, and program committee meetings uh, around the AP regional IGF, which was held in Brisbane last year. At the sub-regional economy level, there were um, national IGFs in Australia, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, Bangladesh, uh, Afghanistan, and youth, importantly, youth initiatives as well, which were supported uh, by, by staff um, mentoring support and, and some financial support in some cases. Government engagement is pretty important. One of one of APNIC's um, missions under the bylaws actually is to represent the interests and needs of the community at government and policy level. So we do that um, through the ITU, of course, the UN body that's responsible for um, telecommunications under the under the UN framework. There were um, major meetings last year, uh, including on the World Summit of in on Information Society, uh, telecommunications standardisation, <clears throat> etc. APT is the regional body that feeds into, it's an intergovernmental body that feeds into the ITU. And uh, there were preparatory meetings for the uh, Policy and Regulators Forum for the uh, World uh, Telecommunications Standardization Assembly, which is coming up um, this year, and several other activities. Uh, the, the, under the United Nations banner, generally, there's the, um, the, the process of the Global Digital Compact, which you may or may not have heard about, but other activities like the Convention on Cybercrime and various other Various others that APNIC is being asked often to um, to contribute to or to to uh, send experts to, and plenty of other events. <laughs> excuse me again, uh, regarding um, IPv6, internet governance in general, uh, uh, questions like cybersecurity fragmentation, uh, effective capacity building. Uh, there was training for law enforcement agents to understand uh, our world better in um, Oceania and Taiwan and Sri Lanka last year. Uh, Cyber Safety Pacific. Pacifica and events for uh, Interpol and G20. So that governmental engagement is 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 done. Um, frankly, on a bit of a shoestring. It's a very small team, but there's a lot to do if we're going to effectively keep informing um, governments about about APNIC and our activities and how uh, they need to you know understand and, and interact with APNIC. Uh, community engagements tracked pretty systematically across a, a whole lot of different types of engagement activities, and the the biggest one there is. Um, 192 events, uh, you can see around, um, what, 45% uh, were training events, 192 training events in total, uh, 33 member outreach, 28 NOG, 27 security, 21, um, what, 41 in total um, for the foundation, et cetera, et cetera. And we, uh, we do look at the spread of those events around the, around the region. The vast majority of them are in the region, but the black, uh, Segment on the on the lower right represents uh, what ten percent or less of um of events that happen uh, outside of our outside of the Asia Pacific region. General uh, community participation statistics here: there were six hundred and eleven participants in special interest groups uh, over the last year. There were six hundred twenty newcomers to conferences out of the numbers that I gave you earlier. The fellowship program is very active and very structured these days. We had uh, four hundred ninety one fellowship applications last year, uh, selecting uh, 32 fellows. Uh, this was for the second APNIC meeting. 19 female, 12 male, uh, eight of them youth participation. We had 
uh, 19 mentors, including nine from the community, and thanks to those who, who helped. And we also tracked the attendance. So those fellows were asked to attend webinars. They had 95% attendance. They did 120 plus academy courses and 94% um, graduated with a phenomenal net promoter score of 100 out of 100, which means that everyone would strongly recommend this program to everyone they know, basically. Um, Orbit is the last thing here. It's the it's the new um, web-based uh, interface into the mailing list system that allows you to participate in mailing lists equally and interchangeably by email, the, the old way, or by uh, a more social uh, media a styled uh, interface and there were 1378 new users nearly 2000 new posts last last year and and work's going on to improve that because it really is a successful way to bring um particularly i'd say newcomers into the the apnic mailing list community apnic academy is the label for all of the training uh, that is provided by apnic whether it's online uh face-to-face -face, instructor-led self-paced or lab-based and so there were uh, 30 plus training events, 16 of them at NOGS, three of them with NIRs, two at Apricot, six at APNIC 56, uh, four of them that I meant touched on before with the Asia Pacific Telecommunity Group in four different um, economies, 40 different uh, instructor led online tutorials uh, pre presented. But also there's a lot of uh, work going into and a lot of use of the new, of the online self paced courses. And there were a couple of new courses there. Uh, there were a whole bunch of new virtual labs added to that uh, to that framework. So eleven new labs on on different technical um, topics, upgrades to um to other labs, and we now have um, forty three community trainers spread around the region. Thirty three of them are, are voluntary. Thank you very much. Ten of them are retained, which means that they receive small amount of compensation to be reliably available for training and also to help us uh, to help APNIC with them um, with training content and checking and development and so forth as needed. And again, more stats on the on the right hand side. Um, 4,782 students to instructor-led courses last year, uh, 9,700 new students uh, in online self-paced courses, uh, bringing the total uh, academy student population to more than 34,000. Uh, 25,000 hours spent on virtual labs. Uh, so it's it's really it's really a busy um, a busy area of activity. I think we if we don't seem to have charts, I think, but the charts are all going onwards and uh, upwards to the right, which is great. And of course, the Academy Product Group has got its roadmaps, which are which have been completed this year, including reporting, certification, um, technical assistance platform, and then an, an additional goal there, which was migrating an old the existing training wiki into the into the Academy for an integrated uh, service. So RPKI is one of the technical services that is uh, supported very strongly. Or Technical topics, sorry, that's uh, supported strongly within the develop, development team and under the development uh, pillar. So, just in particular, twenty-eight of the training sessions were were on RPKI, uh, led led quite a few by community trainers. We had a deployathon last uh, meeting. We've uh, we provide direct technical assistance, which tends to uh, result in in increases in the RPKI coverage in every case, which is always good to see. Uh, on the APNIC blog, there are case studies of RPKI deployment and 16 separate posts about RPKI on the blog if you'd like to look at those. And yeah, as I said, um, training uh, and technical assistance boosts the ROA coverage uh, very quickly. And so we've got Lao, Vanuatu and uh, Macau who all um, exceeded 90% coverage last year. And the, the top 10 economies are here um, in terms of ROA coverage. Congratulations to India with um, uh, 3,700 3, networks covered by ROAs. Uh, Indonesia's got 2,600. Bangladesh, uh, nearly 1,500. Then there's a scattering scattering of others. But it, as uh, as uh, always, there's quite a big variation in the level of RPKI co coverage, and we're particularly trying to bring those up to speed who are who are not yet sort of moving quickly enough. Now, very similar is our approach to IPv6. So that's another sort of key peak technical topic that we are asked um, to support. Um, again, training sessions, uh, some by uh, community trainers, uh, partnerships with governments, and particularly APT has been interested in, in uh, supporting IPv6 uh, very much over, over recent years, and we've been uh, conducting training with those. Also, um, with close collaboration with NIRs, as you see there. 
uh, technical assistance again for, for members who've asked for particular help. Um, and again, case studies, blog posts, and we're looking at 45 percent IPv6 capability in the Asia Pacific. That's higher than the, the global average, which is something like 35 percent. It's consistent with uh, Google's uh, stats, which are about 45 percent glo global use of IPv6. So we really are getting there with IPv6. Um, there's a huge divide in terms of who's moved forward and and who is yet to move. And and APNIC is still working with um, with uh, members and and others uh, where we can help, and uh, you can see, um, but you can see on the right the progress is uh, is going in the right direction still. We're supporting internet infrastructure in terms of mRoot servers. Uh, we've been working on root servers for many years, and mRoot is the the focus these days in collaboration with Wide Project and JPRS in Japan. So quite a lot of activity there. Uh, we've been assisting with IXPs in. Um, in different uh, countries, uh, upgrading and planning upgrades. Uh, by the way, it was very nice to be involved with the uh, the ten year anniversary of BK Nix, which uh, APNIC provided a bit of support to about about ten years ago. So this week that was an auspicious occasion and very very good to see. Uh, the community HoneyNet is is pretty popular and and busy these days. The platform's got. Um, well, 100 more sensors, I don't know what the total is, um, but it, it provides um, daily feeds into Dash to allow you to be alerted when your network is seen as the source of attack traffic. That's pretty useful. And a couple of hundred people are using those alerts at the moment. We also um, provide the, the daily feeds from that, that system out to, to others, Shadow Server and different certs and um, C certs. And the, the quarterly threat sharing uh, sessions, which um, which really keep that live. Um, and also there's workshops and training uh, associated with the HoneyNet project. Okay, I'm getting there, uh, probably over time already, but I think we've got, uh, we've got some time today. Um, information pillar, um, the second last, <clears throat> uh, that includes the APNIC blog and podcasts. We hit um, 5 million all-time views of the, of the blog uh, halfway through the year. And uh, it was a total of more than a million views of the blog, of the blog uh, in the last calendar year. The um, we have a podcast as well, and there are uh, twenty four different podcasts with twenty four thousand uh, genuine plays of those podcasts. Uh, that's ping, of course. You can find the blog and the podcasts on the APNIC website, of course. Information pro products include Rex, the Resource Explorer, which is the the single. Um, graphical interface and the single portal for those who want to understand exactly what's happening with APNIC resources. So where are allocations happening, where they've happened historically, where resources are located. Uh, this goes for, for V4 and V6, and it also integrates um, the V6 um, uh, deployment data as well, um, along with now RPKI and DNSSEC. So that uh, that's Rex. It's it's really worth looking at if you're really interested in browsing around the um, the the distribution of of resources and the the status of those services. Um, Dash the dashboard for AS Health, um, 174 subscribers to alerts, uh, nearly 100 to suspicious traffic reports. Product development again according to the roadmap. So we completed um, roadmap goals like the suspicious traffic alerts like actually bringing in the global RIR data into Rex so you can compare APNIC and other, other regions. Uh, there are Dash widgets now available on my APNIC so you don't have to sort of necessarily hop over to Dash to, to be able to, to make use of that. Um, there's a notification channel so you can configure your notifications according to how you'd like to be notified, for instance, about the suspicious traffic, attack traffic from the HoneyNet. Um, as I said, DNS and RPKI stats and um, and we're prototyping um, a, a graph database uh, interface into routing and registry data. So um, I've spoken a fair bit about roadmaps. We've we've publishing roadmaps uh, for each of the groups. We can bring them all together in this um, in this summary that shows the number of goals completed and in progress, and uh, and one deferred across um, across the entire uh, product. Um, base at, at APNIC. So I'll just mention if, you, if you're not following these product developments, we do present them at every meeting in the products and services session. And this, um, this time, this meeting for the first time, we had a hands-on boff for people who wanted to come and, and learn more and hear more. There's not a lot of time in the, in the 
um, in that regular session to um, to really demo in detail. But you did have a chance this time to um, to look at the products and to use them in detail and understand them a bit more. We had some really nice feedback uh, from the community during uh, during the course of this week about product developments at APNIC. Research and analysis, primarily APNIC Labs. Um, Jeff Houston, as usual, uh, very busy as he was this week, uh, but he's uh, continuing that world leading research on IPv6 capability, but also um, you know, BGP, DNS, uh, quick, a whole lot of metrics that are being, are being published under APNIC Labs and um, cooperating based on that data with initiatives like MANAS, uh, with ICANN, uh, with Cloudflare. So please take a look at labs.apnic.net. Now, just the final pillar is capability, and this is this is about APNIC's internal uh, capabilities to provide technical services to run the organization correctly and so on. So there's a lot that happens internally in the infrastructure area. I'm not going to go into these, but it's across architecture of the of the overall services at APNIC. It's about um, the network and infrastructure operations, the platforms and systems that we operate, uh, security, very importantly, and the um, and the um, the infrastructure for security, and of course the um, as I mentioned before, um, ninety nine point nine nine percent availability on critical services, ninety nine point nine eight on non critical services, and uh, we'll report another uh, digit of um, of precision next time around, I believe. So those are all uh, within our KPIs. So the quality and capability of the organization itself. Um, we have employee engagement surveyed and, uh, and exceeding global benchmarks. We've done an organizational structure review and restructure um, associated with the new strategic plan, which you'll be hearing about. We had zero headcount growth in uh, APNIC funded roles during last year, some extra roles funded elsewhere, for instance, by the foundation. Um, we've got um, Improving improvements to automation of reporting. We've um, revalued the uh, office uh, that we occupy and own in uh, in Brisbane, uh, reflected in the balance sheet and showing an, an, an appreciation that in that value. Uh, there's some taxation issues which are becoming quite um, pressing these days as different economies start to hit AP Nick for GST or value added taxes. And so we've had to do quite a bit of work in several different economies. Um, we've completed that for Singapore and Cambodia. So members in those countries are, um, are needing to pay, unfortunately, um, the, the GST on top of APNIC service or membership fees, but hopefully able to recover those under your normal tax system. And something important and uh, kind of disappointing uh, in a sense is that we had a plan for a new office for APNIC. Um, that has been under under sort of planning and development for the last couple of years, but unfortunately, the the costs for that project escalated really dramatically over two years, um, such that it's uh, approximately double the original cost at the latest estimate and likely to go even higher. So we've actually deferred that project uh, indefinitely. We can't justify spending that much money. Um, in fact, the money was going to be spent by the by the Internet Development Trust, not by APNIC itself, but it, it the in either case, the business case doesn't add up anymore. And APNIC post-COVID, over the last couple of years, we're, we're occupying the current office pretty well, and it's, it's actually going to do for a few more years. So that's a little bit disappointing for those of us who sort of invested time and um, uh, time and uh, and um, energy into that project, but it's the, it's naturally the it's the natural and sensible thing to do. Um, corporate governance uh, governance changes. Um, I referred to some of these last night in uh, in the Meet the EC session because, of course, uh, now the EC members are all appointed as directors of APNIC PDY Ltd. That's been that's the company behind APNIC. Uh, that's something that's been underway uh, for the last couple of years and finally completed this year. As a trustee company instead of an individual trustee holding a sole share in that company on behalf of the EC and therefore of the of the members, and APNIC um, members approved the resolutions to amend the bylaws as you'll remember uh, last uh, last year. Um, corporate insurance, just by the way, um, very important uh, thing that needs to be uh, renewed, reviewed, uh, and as well as our quality systems. Uh, we had an external uh, surveillance audit, audit last year for ISO 9001 with zero non-conformances. We have the system of, um, of 
declaring our uh, our success targets and um, success indicators uh, during the uh, for the year. These were set up at the beginning of last year, well documented in the activity plan. If you'd like to see that, and in the detailed uh, annual plan that's uh, being released, that's been released this week. Uh, but you can see we've, uh, according to the numbers, we we hit 87% uh, of our um, of all of our success indicators last year. Uh, Two percent better than ninety percent completed. Eleven percent less than ninety percent completed. And if you want to understand where which ones they are, they are where and why, then uh, the annual report has got all of those details for you. And that's uh, that's it from me for twenty twenty three at APNIC. Uh, as I said, I think we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, later on, but perhaps after the next reports. I think. Thank you very much for your for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Next, I'd like to invite Max to deliver APNIC Trader Report. Let's have uh, Max to give in the report. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, this is Yoshinobu Matsuzaki, uh, APNIC Ishii Treasurer. So I'll uh, present um, our, our Treasurer Report. Um, so in this um, presentation, all the are uh, in uh, AUD, Australian dollar. Uh, next one. So I have two parts of the report. Uh, number one is a uh, uh, 2023 uh, financial report, and also our, our budget and uh, activity plan for 2024. So first, uh, 2023, our financial report. So highlight, um, we have um, operating deficit of, uh, uh, about, the, oh, I cannot see. Five ninety thousand, uh, but then it's an, uh, less than the, the uh, budgeted one, uh, deficit of uh, 1.1 1 .1 million. So, net surplus after gain on investment, uh, portfolio of uh, 1.1 uh, 1 million. So, total equity, uh, increased by uh, 2.79 uh, million. And now, our, our financial stability measure at the um, almost uh, 16 months of our OPEX. Um, we have an uh, auditor, uh, Ernest Anyan, and the outcome of the audit was uh, unqualified option. So we had the successful uh, audit. So no significant, no significant uh, deficiency in uh, internal control of that report. So our statement of uh, our financial position uh, asset uh, was increased by uh, 5.4 uh, million, and the reliability was increased by 2.6 million. Um, so we have total equity as uh, in, was increased by uh, 2.7 million. Um, financial stability measures, as I said, uh, 2023 full year uh, financial stability measure is uh, almost uh, 16, actually uh, 15.95 months. So if we don't have any income, uh, still we can continue uh, our business as usual uh, for about 16 months. So that's good. Uh, the financial stability measure increase, and the increase in uh, equity from a uh, fair value gain on the investment portfolio value and also the valuation of uh, six Cordelia Street. It's about uh, Epinic office. Good. Statement of uh, financial performance, uh, operating deficit of, as I said, it's um, uh, 560,000, uh, but that's our, our original budget and deficit of 1.1 million. So we decrease the deficit. Uh, of course, revenue, uh, ex excluding the APNIC Foundation funding, uh, 5,000 uh, below budget. And the expenses, uh, excluding the APNIC Foundation project, uh, uh, 515,000 below budget. Net surplus before tax of 1.1 uh, million. Good. Revenues. So we had then 916 new members. 
So that's good. We have a, a good number of that increase here. Um, but then this increase in the 118 uh, historical resource uh, holders account. And uh, we had the 416 crowd membership. Yeah, they have some reason to cross their member account. Well, yeah, we have. And as well, uh, we have other uh, uh, operating income, uh, sundry income, uh, conference grants, and sponsorship income, and the research grant, right? This uh, was about the, our budget. Expenses, yes, uh, we have uh, many um, category of the expenses, but let me ex explain. So salary is um, uh, uh, almost in line with the budget. Uh, we have uh, zero headcount growth in uh, APNIC funded role uh, last year. Computer expenses almost uh, in line, but a bit uh, below the budget, uh, 2. Point, uh, 2 million actual. And the professional fee, uh, almost in line with the, uh, our budget. Travel expense, yes. We had then 1.67 million actual. Um, we control um, our travel budget because uh, of course, uh, post COVID, we have a higher airfare now, but uh, thanks to the internet, we can participate in the event remotely. Uh, with that, we uh, bit decreased our budget uh, compared with the pre-pandemic uh, year 2019. Capital expenditure, uh, total uh, capex, uh, uh, 396,000 uh, actual. Uh, it's an uh, almost 700,000 bureau budget. It's good. Audit outcomes. So as I said, uh, we have an auditor, Ernest and Young, uh, issued an unqualified audit option. So we had the successful audit uh, for our statement. And uh, the financial report of the company uh, comply with the uh, uh, relevant Australian uh, accounting standards because we have a, a legal entity in Australia. Good. So now moving in 2024 um, budget and the activity plan. So key principles, long-term uh, financial stabilities. So we, have some deficit now years, but the, our plan is uh, to have an annual breakdown result by 2027. All right. And revenue uh, in this year, we our uh, fee schedule is the same as uh, uh, last year, so no change in this year. Uh, one thousand one uh, hundred eighty. Uh, you. Uh, Australian dollar base fee and 1.31 bit factor. So it's the same as uh, 2023. Um, expenses, uh, year on year cost growth for uh, business as usual activities uh, to be kept uh, to a maximum annual uh, increase of uh, 4%. And we have some risks of, um, to our budget uh, principles, inflation. So it's out of our control. And uh, yes, we have some expectation, but still uh, not sure. Um, also um, expected and um, um, avoidable costs such as legal and compliance matters to defend EPNIC. So 2024 budget summary, um, we have a budget uh, deficit of uh, 1.2 million and an year on year budget uh, re revenue growth of 1.4% and the year on year on budget expense growth of 3.3%. Right.
So we expect a member groups uh, to have um, 764 new members. So it's like um, uh, 64 uh, new members per uh, month. And no, as I said, no change to fee uh, schedule, uh, fee structure in 2024. Um, then expenses. Our, our budget uh, for 2024, uh, 33 million Australian dollars. No new uh, Lord budgeted for EPINIC for 2024. So I expect no head count growth in 2024. Capital ex expenditure, a uh, five year trend. Of course, uh, we need to schedule our replacement of the, our equipment, like servers, routers, switches. I'm a network engineer, so I know it well. We need a schedule. And uh, we are expecting the uh, 737,000 uh, for this year. So this uh, uh, chart uh, shows the, the distribution, distribution of our uh, budget and also uh, person year by peers. You can have a look uh, how we distribute uh, our resources to each peers in this diagram. That's all from me. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Mats. Okay, we actually have 15 minutes behind ahead of schedule, so we still have a few minutes to go. So I move to the next one will be the open mic. So everyone, please feel free to stand before the mic. And before you speak, please say your name, your affiliation, and to everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Um, I was just going to the presentations. Thank you, Paul, for uh, uh, Rupesh from NPX. Um, thank you, Paul, for the great presentation. I was just curious about the 40 fraud instances that you mentioned uh, in your presentation. Were there more of a financial fraud or was it like a kind of a legal uh, issues or anything like that? And second question to, should I go with the second question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, second question is to Maz. Uh, on the, the financial report, uh, you mentioned the travel uh, expenses, uh, but the comparison of travel expenses, expenses for 2023 was with 2019. So is there any reason why we are comparing, comparing it against 2019 and not against 2022? Thank you. The fraud, um, the fraud cases that we find are, are varied, and and uh, definitely someone from services can get, can give a breakdown if you if you'd like. But we do have uh, we do have strict checks on the identity of of member applicants, and we do frequently have people um, fabricating their identity and trying to join APNIC with with false documentation. That's that's for one thing. And then of course uh, false uh, false declarations of of requirements for addresses, so it's in that that kind of category. The um the reason for the comparison with the twenty nineteen travel is that that was our peak our peak year for travel expenses, and we wanted to show that in in spite of uh, some years having passed and the actual cost of of um, travel having increased, we've got a substantially lower travel budget uh, in the last year than we had in twenty nineteen uh, several years before. So you can see. Uh, in the in the subsequent expense slide, you can see the amount on each year. But we were we were particularly taking 2019 as the peak the peak uh, cost, which was pre COVID. So thought that was interesting and useful to indicate how how travel expenses are being managed. Yes, uh, but I did also notice that in 2022 uh, against the 2022 travel expenses, 2023 uh, travel expenses has increased. Uh, as against the previous year uh, in the report that was prepared. So just wanted, was curious why it was, uh, uh, so that, that was the peak year, I believe. So uh, another question is on the asset side. Uh, I I've, think I've seen uh, the asset investment has increased significantly. 
um, where there's the capital uh, expenses has not increased significantly. So uh, just curious on the why the asset investment has increased uh, suddenly and significantly. Thank you. Well, the, I think the the budget for this year is similar to the budget for last year, but the actuals last year were much lower. Now we we make provisions. We make provisions each year in the budget for what we expect that we may we may need to spend, but we we're not a kind of the kind of organization that just automatically spends money because it was budgeted. We we make sure that the need is there and we'll only spend the money even if it's budgeted, we'll only spend the money if the need is there. And so uh, in the last year we just found that we were um, we were able to to make do and to continue without without the particular capital expenses uh, that we were that we were talking about. There was one large capital provision though last year which was referred to, which is that we have a, a, a geological problem uh, with some of the within the APNIC uh, building where there's some subsidence subsiding of the of the ground within the the basement level, and so that is something that we were uh, planning to rectify, and that is about a about a three hundred thousand US dollar cost. So that was not done last year. The provision is there for this year if we if we need to do that. And we now need to consider that more more seriously because of the need because of the plan now to keep occupying these premises uh, for the for the foreseeable future and not to be moving to a new location. So you know there's quite a, quite a few considerations in in these um, plans and in the in the budget implementation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for watching. Okay. Next. Good morning, EC. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. I have do have a series of questions. So uh, first is uh, Paul. You mentioned that. You have taken care of GST registration in Singapore and Cambodia. Does it mean that you have created legal entities there? Uh, and so th that will be an interesting thing to understand. The second is a new company was registered as APNIC EC Limited, which is now the trustee organization for the sole share, which was earlier there. Does it mean that under the Australian laws now, APNIC EC Limited is the parent organization and APNIC PTY Limited becomes a subsidiary of the APNIC EC Limited. Uh, and if yes, then do we want to publish the consolidated statements going forward? The third is, uh, Max, you mentioned that the revaluation of six Cordelia Street brings financial stability. Uh, what is the basis for that? Because you are staying in that same building. Uh, so if the value increases, how does it bring the financial stability unless and until you plan to sell it? So that is what I would want to understand. The fourth is uh, the allowance for credit losses has increased twice from 58,000 to 116,000. Uh, what is this nature of credit losses? And the fifth is 4.58 million of foundation receipts. What is the nature of this foundation receipts? Thank you. That's that's quite a list of, of questions. I, I I will um I won't attempt to answer them all this time. No, I, I was tired after asking so many questions. Sure. <laughs> uh, I I think I'd refer the first and second to Nathan and and Jeremy uh, respectively, if that's okay. And then we might need reminders of the third, fourth, and fifth. Thank you. Thank questions. You. I'm sorry. Yep. Thanks. So uh, Nathan Harvey from APNIC Secretariat. I think the first question was around the international tax issues that we've we've stated. And the question was specifically whether we've created legal entities in other economies. <clears throat> we, ha we haven't created legal entities and nor have we created what they call in tax terms, uh, permanent establishments. All we are doing is responding to an increase in uh, overseas tax jurisdictions, taxing what they call um, um, tax at destination, which is trying to capture uh, receipts that are generated from outside the country uh, and, and uh, generating remittances to uh, foreign economies. So we've dealt with Singapore and Cambodia, as we've said, but it may not end there. And so we're undertaking some reviews to see if we've got exposures in any of the other 53 economies that we operate in. Uh, Jeremy Harrison, uh, General Counsel at APNIC. Uh, in regard to the new company, APNIC EC Limited, yes, it, it holds the share in APNIC Proprietary Limited now. So technically, it would be a parent company. Um, from a consolidated uh, financial statement perspective, um, there's not currently plans to because the um, APNIC EC Limited doesn't actually trade or do anything. So it's a 
it's essentially going to be a one pager for for that company because it has no income and uh, also doesn't have any expenses. Uh, but we we will provide an update on that. It hasn't had a full financial year yet, so um, yeah, we'll we'll provide an update later on as it gets closer. Just a counter comment that there will have to be an audit of that APN KC Limited, so there will have to be some expenses. How that expenses will be covered? Auditor. <laughs> Uh, so if, if there are any expenses incurred, for instance, for EC Limited or any company in Australia, there's an annual statement. Um, so as um, part of the trust arrangement that is set up, AP and Proprietary Limited will cover the costs of, yeah. Anapam, I do apologise, but numbers three, four, and The revaluation of the yeah revaluation of Cordelia. The, the financial um the financial stability target for APNIC is that we have retained equity in the company's balance sheet, which is equal to eighteen months of operating expenses. So that was a target that was has existed for a while. It was validated in the member survey time before last, where members uh, either wanted eighteen or twenty four months of uh, of equity. So the revaluation has improved the performance against that stability measure in that because the the property is is worth more on the books it has increased the the equity on the balance sheet so it's in, in, increased the stability measure uh, as uh, which is our target but of course uh, as you as you say it doesn't really have practical effect unless we unless we sell the building and realize the realize the value so it's not so much the stability as the stability target that uh, that um, Maz was reporting. Okay. Should I go to the fourth one? No. No. Please, <laughs> with with the indulgence of the people standing behind you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Mr. Chair, of course. Okay. Can you, can you complete the the fourth question? Yeah, that was on the credit losses, which is appearing in the your audited financial statements. Uh, so last year to 2022, it was somewhere around 58,000. This year it is 116,000. So I just wondering what is the nature of this credit loss? Mason? Uh, you're referring to the provision for debt debts? Possibly. Possibly. This is, this is the answer. Right, right. So, I mean, we've, we've got a very conservative uh, provisioning policy excuse me, at APNIC. And I think as our member revenue grows, um, our provision for doubtful debts is a percentage of that um, of that number. So we take a, a very small uh, percentage of that, uh, considered to be the, the amount that we may not collect, but we generally do. And we also include any specific accounts that we know are at risk. So $116,000 off a membership revenue base of about $25 million. It's, it's a very, very small number. So yes, it has increased, but it's still a very, very small portion of the collectability of our of our membership. This is provision for bad debts. So this is essentially a provision for bad debts. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. thank you. Up there, you're next. Sorry for I'll keep you waiting. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, last one. What is the nature of the foundation receipts of 4.58 million? Thank you. The the APNIC Foundation is, uh, the the purpose of the APNIC Foundation is to, is to um, raise and attract uh, revenue as well as, as well as partnerships and projects, which, uh, which expand APNIC's development uh, mission or goals. Uh, some of those goals are, are, um, are met through activities that the foundation itself operates, so they don't appear in the APNIC accounts. So, for instance, the ISEF small grants program is something that happens outside of APNIC accounts, but quite a number of, of the development projects are implemented by APNIC and in particular by trainers. So the training, uh, also the MROOT project, these are projects for which we are funded by the foundation in order to carry to carry those out, and that that really sort of represents the foundation doing doing its job. Uh, the the effect on the balance sheet or the effect on the finances, however, is that we recognise the revenue, and we also expense the same amount because the it operates on a this the APNIC um, uh, 
carrying out those projects operates strictly on a cost recovery basis. So we recover exactly the the costs that are that are um, are expensed. No, this is a very fair explanation, Paul. Uh, however, my the reason why I asked it was. Uh, your audited statement says that there is no grant received during the year. Uh, so essentially, this qualifies as a nature of the grant. So it it doesn't. Uh, it's not a grant. It's a it's a cost recovery. It's an out. Uh, it's an outsourcing by the foundation uh, for the services provided by APNIC. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I've tech guarantee you. Our next one. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Aftab Siddiqui or Aftab Siddiqui, uh, just for the sake of transparency, I did not ask those questions. So please, in the transcript, it says Aftab. It was an, an Upam. Um, so my question, I mean, I did not write all those questions. And now because of an Upam, I forgot some of them. So uh, number one question I have is, um, we, uh, so APNIC started a uh, historical resource recovery uh, program. So what is the uh, status of that? Uh, how much is uh, still pending and uh, uh, what is the next step towards it? Would we go back to the slide uh, in the secretary report this one? Yeah. And Carla, could you give an explanation of that? It's it's, fa it, it's fairly detailed, uh, as you can see from the, from, from the graph. Carla. Um, hi, Aftab. Um, so this, the current status is that we have actually officially closed the project because um, we decided that we were going to roll the final few 220 odd cases that we hadn't finished at the end of the year into our BAU that we were um, going through this year. We currently have 110 routed cases because we've resolved all the unrouted cases um, that we are still working on. Of those 77 are um, still, we're still waiting for documentation. We're still waiting for additional information um, to come to the Secretariat so we can actually finalize uh, those claims to those resources. Um, and uh, some of them are hijacked and we still need to resolve those with the upstream. Um, and there are, I think it was 28 from memory that um, are basically, oh, there we go. It's, it's, is that last year's numbers? Yeah. Right, end of last year. Um, so there are 28 as of now that are basically uh, recalcitrant. They are um, uh, resource holders who are routing their resources that um, do not want to become APNIC members. So um, we are working with each one of these cases. We have had a lot of communication with all of them. Um, and uh, we're working very closely with the legal team to try and reach some kind of resolution on those. Thank you, Kala. Thank you for that. Um, the last two questions are interconnected, I would say. Um, so, because everybody's aware of the um, uh, outside Australia, the foreign exchange uh, rate is fluctuating like anything. Um, right now, um, if I want to pay uh, for the membership fee, being a member myself, um, two year or three year in advance, is there any provision for that? And why not? Number one, uh, attached to that is uh, the the possible options for me to pay um, incurs a lot of foreign exchange uh, transaction fee, for example, credit card. There are other methods, uh, other payment gateways, which APNIC is exploring uh, to provide more um, uh, easy transactions uh, for people who are not um, in Australia, New Zealand, where the international transaction fee is a big problem. So, Nathan. Okay, Nathan, can you help to explain the provision of advance payment? Let me just read the uh, question again. So um, th there are provisions currently for members and some members do pay two and three years in advance. So that exists already. Um, and we can perhaps talk offline or we can share some more information on that after this as to how we can help you with that. Uh, in relation to transaction fees, APNIC already absorbs the merchant fees on, we don't absorb, if your, if your financial institution charges you a um, transaction fee, we wouldn't absorb that, but we do absorb the merchant fee. Um, in relation to alternative platforms, 
we are exploring. Uh, we had hoped to be a little bit further advanced with that than we are at the moment, but unfortunately with the international tax issues that we've encountered, we've had to defer some of those exploratory activities, but it, it is on our radar and it is something that we're looking at. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I go to online question first and then your next one. Go ahead. So I have two online questions that um, Rob Thomas and Brett O'Hara have asked to be combined into basically one composite question. Rob says, were there any investigations into why the APNIC accounts were closed? For example, did they move their resources to another RIR? And Brett adds, there was a point made that there was quite a number of historical resource management related new members. It would be interesting to know how many of the closing members were historical resource management as well. Okay, Carla, can you help to answer the first question? Uh, this is really stretching my memory. Um, uh, most of the reason for closures is um, unfortunately businesses that regularly just go through a business cycle and um, close. So um, this is this isn't anything in particular that has been um, uh, there isn't any particular cause for concern. We do investigate each one of them. Um, so what usually happens is the investigation is triggered by a non-payment of um, a renewal fee. And um, the it, it goes through a cycle through the finance team first where they try and make contact with the member. Um, and then they pass that on to the member services team if they're not able to do that. We also get in touch with the upstream. So we do make all as many attempts as we possibly can to um, to assist and to help, particularly where there are some challenges with payment. Um, as uh, Nathan's already alluded to, there's, there's a lot of different ways that we can try and help resolve those. Um, so they are investigated. Um, as to how many of the HRM cases uh, were closed, I actually would have to go back to the numbers and check. Um, but please feel free to email myself or Vivek or um, or any one of the member services team, and um, and we can revert to you with those numbers. Um, from memory, they really weren't. There wasn't a significant number um, that had actually closed, as in open membership and um, transfer their resources immediately and closed. Um, but um, I can actually give you those numbers once I can get in front of a computer. Thank you, Carla. Do we have a second, second question in the queue or online? No, okay. Yeah. Your next Hi. one. Good morning. Pankaj Chaturvedi representing ISPI. Uh, some of our members who flew in from India could not attend the uh, you know, open policy meeting yesterday because they were required to register for the apricot since this was apricot yesterday. So my submission to the APNIC EC is that uh, may, is there a way that we can allow the particip uh, in-person participation during the APRICOT for the uh, people who want to attend only the OPMs, like if for the today's, uh, you know, we, all of us are here, but uh, people who landed yesterday who wanted to part be part of the OPM in person could not do so. Not only from India, I, I see a lot of my friends from Bangladesh also are attending today. They did not attend yesterday. So that is one uh, submission I thought I'll request EC to work out uh, some kind of a changes or whatever can be done. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your feedback and also appreciate your, your participation and contribution here. Uh, thank you. Sharma from Data Communications India and representing ISPA also. Uh, two requests, sir. One is more work on cyber frauds, uh, which is becoming day by day a big issue in all the telecom administrations. Secondly, related to is the cyber monitoring also and the monitoring of the networks and the interaction with the LEAs. There, you need to have an increased role of interaction with the telecom administrations as well as the law enforcement agencies so that there is a certain standardization which happens because what is happening is the network efficiency is getting sacrificed for tra uh, monitoring a traffic in a particular man manner. Uh, so a certain kind of interaction there, more active participation is required by APNIC with the telecom ad administration on that also. So these are the two submissions which I wanted to. 
Thank, thank you very much. Those are, those are, are interesting, and um, I'm sure they're important important suggestions. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that these things are noted in the in the proceedings of this uh, meeting, but I'd just also mention again, in case you're not aware, that the survey that's underway at the moment is is also an opportunity where you might um, be able to make those suggestions, and also if there are others who share your who share your opinions, then they can also make those uh, suggestions, and the feedback can be aggregated and considered with with everything else that APNIC is uh, is being asked uh, to do. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, all our all your, your recommendations actually are already recorded during the annual general meeting. So we will definitely will take a look to see how we can improve the service from APNIC. So any other question from the floor? Yes, please go ahead. Anupam Agarwal from India Internet Foundation. This is not a question, this is a comment uh, for easy to consider if they feel fit to consider. Uh, you are you have made a lot of changes in this year and also submitted the budget for 2004 year uh, going forward budget, uh, which has got a very positive vibe attached to it, that things are evolving. But what has what makes me a little concerned uh, is that uh, there is a lack of willingness of engagement by the new APNIC staff who are in the corridors, uh, who have come to this meeting. Uh, if I remove the first two tires of APNIC, uh, whom I have been interacting since last uh, a decade or so, uh, there is absolutely no engagement from the new staff members with the community. So I see them working within themselves. But uh, if I approach them, then possibly I am a newest kid on the block and there is no trace of uh, people who are in part of the community for so long. So my humble submission is that uh, this is a community and the staff needs to go out and and this is a wonderful opportunity for them to meet so many people. Uh, and I see a lack of willingness to do that. So if something can be done about it, it will be really good. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a very variable recommendation. And uh, to, to encourage the member to engage with the member is uh, one purpose of the APNIC meeting, especially the meeting like this kind. It's a great opportunity for you and to exchange the idea, especially interacted with APNIC, uh, either EC or APNIC staff. I think that's a very good recommendation. Thank you. And next one. Roy from uh, Vanuatu. Uh, I would just like to appreciate uh, APNIC. I uh, saw so in the report that uh, there was a lot of uh, efforts and support that APNIC uh, gave to Vanuatu. And I'm speaking on behalf of the small island nations. And we look forward for more APNIC uh, support in the Pacific region. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I believe that contribution goes to APNIC staff and also APNIC Foundation and a lot of collaborative partners as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback. So we still have nine minutes to go. Any other question from the floor? Is any question from online? Okay, once again, any other question from the floor? So hearing now, I suggest we take a break at this moment. We come back at 11.30. So I see you in 11.30. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much.